Spend less time searching and more time hauling loads with the Truck Stop Load Board. Find the right load at the right time to put more money in your pocket. Learn more today. Let the truck! You are listening to Why the Truck! Are you ready to truck it? It's time for your new year with Dooner. Welcome to Friday. Thank you for joining us. If you're live on FreightWaves.com or across social media at noon, if you listen on Road Dog Trucking, 5 p.m. or 11 p.m., Listen to On Demand on Podcast Players. Thanks for coming on the show. When I left you on Wednesday, we were talking about that rail strike, right? It was the 11th hour before the Canadian rail strike. It's going to be a big deal and a big issue. Well, it went through. Y'all heard the news yesterday. It happened. Well, a lot of developments have happened since then, and it's a little confusing. So let me lay this one out for you. There's the full story on FreightWaves.com. But even since we published this, a few things have changed. But right here, Trains.com via, no, right here, Trains.com via FreightWaves.com says, the Teamsters Canada Rail Conference is taking down its picket lines at Canadian National Railway and begin returning to work, the union said in a brief statement earlier today. But the union said the work stoppage continues over at Canadian Pacific Kansas City, pending an order from the Canadian Industrial Relations Board acting on Thursday's order from Labor Minister Stephen McKinnon. It says here, despite the Labor Minister's referral, um, there is no clear indication that the CIRB will actually offer an end to the labor dispute at CPKC. The two sides met with the CIRB on Thursday, the union said, and will do so again today at 10 a.m. Eastern time. So that already happened, but I'm not sure what development has come from there. CPKC said in a statement issued after Thursday's meeting with the CIRB that it was fully prepared to address the resumption of service given its obvious priority but the union refused to discuss any resumption of service and instead indicated that they wished to make submissions to challenge the, constitu the constitutionality of the minister's direction as well as the CIRB's uh, discretion to proceed with any order. That's what that whole 10 a.m. meeting was about today. They say here, well, the minister directed the CIRB proceed expeditiously. Any decision by the CR CIRB on the resumption of service will be delayed. CPKC remains prepared to resume service as soon as it is ordered to do so by their union, the CIRB. Um, CPKC is disappointed by this delay, which will affect our ability to resume servicing the Canadian economy. That's from CPKC. The TCRC represents about 3,300 trained crew members at CPKC, as well as a small number of rail traffic and controllers who are also off the job. About 6,000 crew members are returning to work at CN. But wait, there's more coming on that because they just issued a statement here. Where is it? Right now, Teamsters Canada Rail Conference, this came out about 15 minutes ago, issued an official strike notice to Canadian National Railway to withdraw their 6,500 workers. It comes just hours after the union said it was taking down its picket lines. So we're not out of the woods yet. I know a lot of people are posting rail strikes over. No, it's not. CPKC is not back to work. CN may be back off the job on Monday. This is a one-day thing right now as I'm reading it. Hopefully this changed. Hopefully there's better developments that come along. But this is how it is. And you know what? I, I've been listening around. A lot of you seem to be a little blindsided but what about what happened here. Probably not what the truck listeners, but some of your partners definitely are. So this is a good catalyst. Call them up. It's a good time to educate some partners. All right, this is news out of uh, Massachusetts. This isn't necessarily new news, but it was getting a lot of traction yesterday. Take a look over here. Bostonians against Mayor Wu posted, starting, starting January 1st, 2025, Massachusetts is banning the sale of brand new diesel trucks and only allowing the sale of electric trucks. This is because Massachusetts adopted the carb low NOx omnibus rule to address the emissions from diesel trucks. Truck dealerships are furious. Here is a notice from one of them. They said, as a result, we will not be able to sell or release a diesel truck built after 1231 2024 to a customer that plans to register it in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in 2025. We'll be forced to sell vehicles in other states or not sell at all. The financial impact on our employees, our company, our customers, and the Commonwealth will be massive. Over the last five years, heavy duty registrations in Massachusetts have averaged 875 per year. Medium duty registrations have averaged 670 per year. Assuming the average cost of heavy duty truck at $175,000 and the average cost of medium 
medium duty truck at $110,000. This adds up to over $225 million in sales. The impact on the Commonwealth will be a loss of over $14 million in state sales tax, not to mention excise tax and registration fees. Our, our own Craig Fuller says truck registrations in mass are about to go to zero. Interesting too, because what are they supposed to buy? I saw some of the trucks out there, but I, like, I don't know if some of the Nicholas out there could really serve Massachusetts that well. Uh, there's some stories about Tesla semis, NFI. I have some data from them we'll talk about in a little bit. Speaking of Tesla semis, there's a scam. We're going to get into that too. But here is one cool story I want to put out here before I move on, because I love it, and I hope this becomes a trend, and college football season is coming back. Pilot sponsored the Tennessee Vols Stadium, and they're doing something super cool. Usually you see a company come in, they sponsor a stadium, they slap their own stupid name on there, like Boston Garden becoming TD Bank Garden. Nobody calls the damn place TD Bank Garden. We call the place Boston Garden. And Volunteers fans, they call this place Neyland Stadium. So good job, Pilot. You're a Knoxville-based company. You get the culture. Caleb Reveal reports, Pilot Travel Center is the largest network of travel centers in North America, is partnering with Tennessee Athletics to preserve and renovate the iconic Nyland Stadium at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Knoxville-based Pilot announced in the news release that the company and Tennessee Athletics are breaking new ground in the college sports by entering that multi-year partnership to preserve it. And here's the great thing. This partnership is going to last 20 years. So the name is safe for the next two decades. Good stuff. Henry Byer says, UT is hitting on all cylinders right now. Watch out, Arkansas. The Vols are coming for the title of number one supply chain program in the country on all fronts. It's like that sign over there. I, I'm, I'm in a weird situation. I got an honorary degree from University of Arkansas Supply Chain, so I'm on their team. But I am a marketing advisor at University of Tennessee. God, go Vols. Go Razorbacks. Go both. They're not playing. The mocks are playing the Vols. Game one. It's going to be a rough one. Oh, and Chad Carlton, he says, switching three PLs is like dumping your girlfriend, but you live at her house, then asking her to pack your things and deliver them neatly to your new girlfriend's house. And the last thing you said was, it's not me, it's you. There's a thought. All right, on episode 750 of What the Truck, I'm talking about the Canadian government ordering into rail strike. We already got to that one. Scammers are targeting zero emission fleets in California by offering them bogus Tesla semi reservations. We got Talent Logistics' Mike Bush. He's going to talk about how it works and why he was smart enough not to fall victim for it. Uh, to it. Uh, a couple of great ladies in logistics, they are clapping back against you creeps in the DMs. Yeah, the clock has struck midnight on you creeps because we are coming for you today. So if you're a creep on LinkedIn, listen closely. Listen closely about your behavior because today is the day you are put up on the podium. All right, and Journeys, Will Jenkins, he demos this brand new AI role-playing tool. It allows you to practice cold calls, warm calls, discovery calls, uh, prank calls. I don't know. Can we do prank calls, Will? We'll find out. Um, Got to tip the band? Let's get into the show. If you're ready to move more freight, make more money, and manage your freight business with speed and confidence, look to Truck Stop for tools that transform the way you move freight. Learn more over at truckstop.com. But right now, Mike Bush, he is the head of marketing over at Talon Logistics, Inc. Mike, what's happening, my man? It's been a couple weeks. It has, Dana. Great to see you, my friend. So, yeah, to your point, and I think you, this is, you mentioned California. I think based on the news you just shared, we might see this in Massachusetts soon, too. Uh, it started with a LinkedIn message. I got a message from somebody outside the industry who said, hey, I know that Talon's doing the clean trucking thing. That's not a state secret. Hell, man, our, our, our CEO was at the White House talking about the, the validity of clean trucks. Um, and it, the guy started by saying, hey, I have reserved a bunch of Tesla semis. It turns out I don't want to use them. So I've got an option. I can get my money back from Tesla or I can try to sell the reservation. Um, you know, for a small premium, maybe five grand extra, you can take my reservation. And at first, it sounds like an interesting thing, right? We're looking for EVs. We're figuring out, is there a chance for us to work together on this? But there's a lot of challenges and there's a lot of issues here. The first one is Tesla doesn't allow you to transfer your reservation. So when I asked him about that and said, how do we want to go around this? He said, oh, don't worry about it. You can start the trucking company in my name and run it as your own trucks, which immediately is kind of a bit of a red flag. Yeah. So from there, start to have the conversation really like as to what this looks like. I asked him for copies of the reservations uh, and all the fine print. He said, oh, I'll get them to you as we get further along. Now, at this point, I'm, I'm, you know, I'll be honest, I'm feeling a little nervous. I'm thinking this guy might not be legit. So I asked a couple other drivers. There are a couple other carriers here in, in California. Are you seeing this type of thing? Has this guy reached out? And where, where it got really interesting is I got a note from two other guys in this market that said, I got the same exact note but it's not from the same person. 
So now there's mm. three people sending the same note. I mean, look, you and I have probably uh, over time copy pasted an email to somebody. If you're in a sales role, you do that stuff occasionally. But to have it come from a different email address, a different person's name, that's a huge red flag to me. Absolutely a huge red flag. So did they? So were they looking up who had already gone out and got some of these credits and were holding them? Or did they just sort of see you guys promoting? Because you have that uh, FCEV. You've got a few BEVs. I think, I think 20% of your fleet now is actually um, ZEV. That's exactly right, Dieter. I think there's, there's a few different ways you can look at it. So you can say... This guy was driving around looking for anybody who was driving a, a clean truck. So anybody who had a Volvo with their logo on it, anybody who had a Nikola with their logo on it, anybody, you know, along those lines. That's one way to do it. The other way is to just, quite frankly, Google clean trucking in California. You're pretty easily going to come up with the list of trucking companies that have put zero emission trucks on the road. So I think that's probably how they found us. And, and you know, it was other trucking companies with clean trucks that had heard from this gentleman or this group, whatever it might be. Um, what was really interesting, and this is kind of that scamming 101 thing, I'm sure that there's a playbook that exists on the internet, is you go from the very business focused, hey, would you consider this? Is there a way for us to work together? To once you say no, you start to get these personal messages. Hey, you know, man, look, I thought we were, I thought we were moving forward. You know, I, I told other truckers that, that you're my guy and I'm not going to work with them. You know, why are you ghosting me, bro, type message? And you, you find yourself going, one, this is a business transaction, and two, why press so hard if there are other companies that are interested? That's the point. I know where we walked away. I know where a couple other companies walked away, but it was really interesting to see this this thing sort of evolve. It's no different than you know, kind of the the I've got tickets available on Craigslist. Let me FedEx them to you, scam, or you know, even going old school, the, the Prince of Nigeria who says, "Look, I really, really need your help, please." You know, there, there's people's lives at stake. You get that emotional component to it, and that's kind of the scamming 101. Yeah. Well, I, I like that I lack empathy so then I don't have to care about those types of scams. I don't get caught up in them. But Mike, I got to tell you something. So he tried to like emotionally blackmail. He was like, why are you ghosting me? Interesting. Absolutely. I, I got a note that said, why are you ghosting me, bro? And I, and I thought, OK, we're yeah, that, that, that doesn't work for in, in any sale I've ever been a part of. How many fleet? How many fleets did you say you're aware of that have got hit by this scam? So I, I talked to two other fleets that that had had, had the same experience. Um, you know, what was interesting is, that, you know, the guy's name, I don't remember. I think it was like, well, let's, let's call him John Smith. Other other fleets got the same exact message, but not from John Smith, but from somebody else, from Tim Dooner or from, you know, uh, Craig Fuller or whatever it might be. And, and it, it was interesting to watch. Wait a minute. This guy's trying to run the same scam or this group is trying to run the same scam across the trucking industry as a different person for each of us so that hopefully we don't connect the dots. Because if I go say, man, you know, Joe Smith, Joe Smith really did me wrong here. Hopefully other, ca other carriers wouldn't catch him for it. Mike, it's going to be, you mentioned a good point. Our, our initial story about Massachusetts, you're not being out to buy diesel trucks start of 2025. That is a less mature market than even California. A lot of carriers there could get blindsided by this kind of scam. They're not as familiar with working in the space and will probably be scrambling trying to look to get some trucks or at least to pilot some trucks, which is going to be a real challenge up in the Northeast. Yeah, Dina, I think you're right. I think it's both the Northeast and the Northwest. I know, uh, you know, there, there was a meeting, uh, I believe, yesterday in Seattle talking about, you know, having the trucking community come together. And, uh, you know, the Washington State Truckers Association just penned a letter saying, let's hold off on this carb thing. Let's be a little more um, thoughtful in our approach. And that's coming from the trucker perspective. But you, you're seeing wa Washington State and state of Massachusetts really start to push these zero emission vehicles. You know, Mike, we actually we have some. It's been very hard to get data on the Tesla Semi. Fortunately, NFI actually just posted this two days ago. Um, I know you haven't been able to test a Semi, and you didn't. You weren't able to buy a fake reservation on one. But NFI, they posted some results. They said their team was doing. They were going out of Patterson, California. They were doing routes between 200 and 450 miles. But what's interesting is it doesn't say straight. It says supporting by fast charging infrastructure. I'm assuming they were not able to go 450 straight. It says over 6,000 miles. The Tesla Semi demonstrated an efficiency of one point. 0.64 kilowatt hours per mile. That's actually really good, um, with 60% of those miles covered at speeds of 50 miles per hour or greater. But it's not, it sounds like they're just looking to evaluate. They're just looking to test. This sounds like a lot of the BEV companies who are testing right now I've talked to, they're like, it's a start. Yeah, Dinner, I think you're right. You know, I think when, when you look at it, even at, uh, at the ACT Expo this year, Tesla took the stage and there, there's still a lot of numbers that haven't been shared. There's what is the actual range on the truck? What is the actual weight of the truck? And that's a yeah. huge thing when it comes to the zero emission trucks. You know, some of the battery electric trucks are 11,000 pounds heavier than a diesel comparison. So as, as a drainage provider, that means 
you know, you need to find lighter containers, which means either one, hauling goods for free to lay because chips weigh nothing, or, you know, asking your shipper, hey, can you load the container three quarters of the way what you would typically do? So I think, you know, it, it's awesome to see that the Tesla's in production. It's awesome to see another alternative out there. I'm anxious to see a lot more of the numbers and, you know, kudos to NFI for, for sharing their early results as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we have to know that. And a lot of people, a lot of times when I post this truckers, they get very defensive and they go, well, it can't do this and it can't. And it's like, look, if you want to make an argument for or against this, you need to do these pilot programs. You need to have the real world data. Look at Ryder, for example, Ryder, they went to ACT and they said, well, in, in our testing, here are the issues that we're finding with this. You guys are doing testing. You're like, here are the issues that we're finding with this. We have a documentary coming about, about the good side of it, but also some of the challenges. One of the big things that's going to come up in that documentary, which would should be out. Um, next week, we got all the finalization, so it should be out in about two weeks. Um, we're we're going to talk about trailers. One of the big focuses is just finding lighter trailers to make the math work where that nine to 11,000 pounds are cutting into total weight. You're absolutely right. You know, and I think it's funny you mentioned Ryder, I, that the study that they published at, at the ACT Expo was really interesting because they took the exact wrong use case for, for, for electric trucks. They said, yeah. you know, it there's there's no way to use electric trucks and battery electric trucks on on otr and i don't think anybody's out there screaming otr is the right fit for battery electric trucks i think when you look at drayage when you look at going less than 200 miles on a run drayage can be a really interesting and, and powerful solution nfi is you know a drayage provider makes a lot of sense for them to be to be in this market whereas for for rider to go off and say hey look this is the wrong truck for otr man i i would agree with them i i, I suspect you know it's, it's going to be hydrogen it's going to be you know, some of the bio biodiesel or the biomass fuels that, that really fit that OTR need. So we're going to see a bunch of different types of trucks on the road, all of which hopefully over time become, you know, a lot better for the environment. Mike, before I let you go real quick, there is that, uh, well, I guess it's called the lockout. And it's funny because I, I actually had slacked my editor and I said, this is a really confusing story because we were told we couldn't use the term strike. And I was like, OK, I'll use the term lockout. It actually made me think of that MLB lockout back in the day. Well, I guess apparently CN is now striking to retaliate for them telling they couldn't do their lockout. So now it is a strike. And now I can use that again. Thank you, BJ. Uh, but has that impacted you at all? Or are you because uh, you guys are in Dre, but you're down in SoCal. But are any anticipation of uh, trouble with this? Yeah, you know, dinner. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure what's going to happen. I think to your to your point, this is definitely a moving target. Uh, I think that you will see um, some shippers immediately start to move uh, their, their containers and where they're coming because of the uncertainty. Uh, coming in, you know, if I were coming into Vancouver, that area, I'm probably looking immediately at Seattle, uh, Seattle yeah. Tacoma, because it's it's quite close. Um, you know, I'm probably looking at is there an opportunity to go into California uh, for some of the overflow, but I would. I, I would suspect that that SeaTac is going to be where it's at for for a couple of months on the the West Coast and on the East Coast. You may see Boston or New York pick up some extra volume. Yeah, you know, a lot of people today they kind of in, ig ignored the part where it said may resume soon, and they just said, "Okay, the strike is over," but it, it is not. CBKC is still negotiating, and CN said they're going to strike on Monday if they don't come up with this resolution. So hopefully, something happens there. Mike, in the meantime, if people want to connect with you, they want to check out Talon. Where do I send them? Yeah, so it's uh, talentlogisticsinc.com or dinner. You guys can find me on uh, on Twitter at Mike Bush. Mike, awesome stuff. We should have that documentary out, like I said, in a couple weeks, and it's going to be glorious. Take care, my man. Pleasure as always, man. Take it easy. All right, uh, let's check out this. This guy's trying to pull out of his space. Let's see what happens. Don't hit my mirrors. Don't hit my mirrors. Don't, please don't hit my mirrors. Tail swing. Please, please no tail swing. I'm not in a position to where I can get out. Pete, honk. Why is he honking? Uh, yeah. No! <laughs> now he's honking. This is my, my door. How about... Oh, he's going. He's going. He's taking off, too. Son of a don't you pull off. Get back here. Get back here, you Conestoga bastard. 
I need to make that a t-shirt. Speaking of t-shirts, go to WTTgear.com. Get your ass one. We got the USA logo on there or scan the QR code. Uh, as I said, I got a better deal for my vendors. Same shirt, same rug, spud cotton, awesome bell and canvas shirts. They're just 25 bucks instead of 30 now. Uh, we got the crop tops also for the ladies out there. Look at that. All designs, 25 bucks in those as well. And you know who got one of these? My buddy Shane Duncan, check him out. He says, getting my workout in when traveling. Shout out to Timothy Dooner, our last sport, my What the Truck shirt. He's crazy about the logistics industry. He's equipping companies for girls. Shane Duncan, of course you are. Go get that workout in, my man. All right, all right, it's the topic of the hour. Shimmy Munson and Lacey Wanzak are here to talk about it with me. Ladies, thank you, first of all, so much for coming on the show. This is a topic that we sort of all know exists, but we definitely do not talk about frequently enough. Yes, hi. Hi. Hey, introduce yourself. Shimmy, you start first. Shimmy, say hello. Hi, I'm Shimmy. Uh, thanks for having me back on. Uh, I'm with Strategic Transport, and yeah, I'm excited to talk about the creeps. <laughs> the creeps. You are excited to talk about the creeps. Lacey, you as well. Um, mm -hmm. You kind of kicked this off. You were very brave. You put a post out on, on LinkedIn, and a lot of the female logistics community immediately took notice. They immediately started cheering you on. And one thing that really stuck out to me wasn't even just your example. It was the fact that so many other ladies were saying that something similar had happened to them. And they had a similar experience. And for whatever reason, they felt voiceless. And I'm going to give you a little data before we jump into this. But this is according to the Institute of Developmental Studies. 66% of women have faced cyber harassment. 63% have experienced cyber stalking. 43% have received unwanted sexual images and advances. 85% of women know this is a problem because they know a woman who has experienced this. This is big numbers. And it's concerning because of not just the people doing it, but if you're in a company, let's say you're completely apathetic, you're soulless, you have no morals, here is why you should also care about this. ASAT reports a notable instance of employer liability inv involved uh, Fry Electronics, which was ordered to pay $2.3 million in a lawsuit filed by the EEOC. The case centered around an assistant store manager who started texting another coworker there, uh, sexual images, sexual advances. The company didn't do anything. In fact, they fired the supervisor. And this might be why a lot of ladies don't come forward. They fired the supervisor. She came forward to initially, and this ended up being a big multi-million dollar lawsuit. Lacey, let's start with you. What, what, what's going on? What's, what's the problem happening here? Um, I think part of the problem is um, people just have the audacity to message women on LinkedIn. And I think they're viewing LinkedIn more and more as a dating website more than they are a professional website. And, um, you know, and, I, and I'm, that's just touching on LinkedIn. I'm, that's not even touching um, things in the workplace. But I, I think what's happening is people are afraid to report these incidences because they are um, scared that they might lose their job or, you know, they they might get, um, you know, critiqued and they're not saying, you know, truthful things about this. They're not, you know, they're not telling the truth. And I, I, I find that to be very wrong. Um, I think, and more and more, I hear a lot of women that come to me about similar stories and and they haven't said anything they don't say anything because they're scared that's going to put their livelihood in jeopardy yeah i mean it, it can be viewed a lot of ways people can get very defensive about these kind of things where they can start victim blaming they can start saying oh well what did you do to encourage it and it may also be in an awkward position for a lot of you ladies where um you know someone sent you something pretty foul pretty vulgar but at the same time reporting it means like now you got to tell your spouse about it. now you got to explain this to this person now you got to explain this yeah. to that person and it's hard to always get that context out there. Shimmy, what's been your experience with this? We all, we all know it's going on. Yeah. I mean, it's been going on and, and, you know, for, well, this all started because, um, you know, unfortunately it, it's not just, it's not just, um, it's not just, uh, LinkedIn, right? Like Lacey said, but Lacey had posted this, um, and it was actually the same person is what it had started with. And so for me, uh, being able to see the messages that she had and knowing exactly who that was based off of my own experience, and then learning that there were several other women that had experienced this with the same person, it opened up a conversation that was really important in the industry, um, that it's just, it's so rampant that you could just post on it on, on a 
on a website that has or, or linked on a platform that has hundreds of thousands and millions of people. And, and there are several women who knew exactly who it was and had experiences with the same person. It was just mind boggling. It was absolutely mind blowing um, that right away you could tell who that was. Um, but opening up the conversation is, I think, the most important thing because it is it is important to note that as women in this industry, there is a level of crudeness that we do experience and we are a part of, right? I have a trucker mouth. I'm not ashamed of it. But where I draw the line is if we say no, if we are very black and white and we are very clear and you continue to push, that is crossing the line. And then if you are using your position of power as a man over a woman, uh, to affect their, you know, livelihood. If you don't do what I say, if you don't give in to the flirting or the incessant calling and texting, even though they've been told no, I'm not going to give you my freight. There's a huge problem. It's not just that something would be crude, but it's that you're crossing boundaries that have been very clearly laid out. You're using that a, you're using a dynamic. A yeah, you're levering. I saw some of those those text messages. And you bring up you bring up a great point. Two things about it too. One is that the the behavior is pathological. It's happened to multiple people. This isn't an instance where you can say, mm-hmm. okay, we were both a little flirty, and maybe this guy just went a little bit too far, and you said no, and like that, like are we overreacting here? No, this is pathological behavior where the person not only takes it off of the social media site, but now they have your personal phone number, they have a business relationship with you, and they're threatening to withhold business from you. They're trying to use a position of power to leverage you, which is awful which is completely and what do you do in that situation because we all know that this company this business at times can be soulless and companies can go yeah well they represent sixty thousand dollars in revenue Mm -hmm. and unfortunately that's just kind of where we're at is at some we do to a degree either have to take it or we lose our we lose money and it's the economy we can't really afford to just lose money so sometimes we're just taking it Lacey, how, how, what would you recommend to women who, especially the ones who feel sort of voiceless or powerlessness, who are experiencing this type of harassment, especially the kind that is getting incredibly uncomfortable, the kind like you experience where it's coming off of LinkedIn and, and onto your, your cell phone? I would say if, if this is something that you can't bring forward um, to the person that is doing this to you, or maybe somebody that had, you know, that is in a direct um position to, you know, have some power over this person, um, tell somebody, tell anybody, um, there's no shame in telling your story. There's no shame in, you know, coming forward with this kind of abuse. It is, it's abuse. It's not, you know, and specifically the situation that I was in, um, was a three month long, um, you know, what I would consider you know, harassment. And, you know, there's a line where you have to draw where you're like, okay, this isn't okay anymore. And you have to tell somebody, anybody, I don't care who it is. Tell your husband, tell your girlfriends, tell somebody about it. Because eventually, I think um, you're going to know somebody that has gone through the same thing. And that's going to give you, you know, maybe the confidence to actually come forward and say something or somebody might say something for you this kind of um, behavior is not acceptable in the workplace it's not acceptable on linkedin it's not really acceptable anywhere um no. to have this have this kind of behavior well and, and Lacey, like I, I think that a lot of guys may, hearing this um they might be somewhat i'm not completely surprised but they might be surprised at the frequency that this happens because I don't typically get like harassed and I get harassed by salespeople. I get harassed by podcast editors. I get harassed by people who want to market, but I very rarely get sexually harassed in my DMs. It just does not really happen. How frequently does this happen to ladies? Because we hear stories all the time. Daily. If every, every single other. day? Uh-huh. Every day. These uh, under, if- their profes- under their freaking professional name with their title and their entire goddamn resume and a link to their own company. There's still dudes who are just yes. sitting there... Her- in a world where you can just screenshot this kind of stuff. Yes. Yep. All the time. 
It's and it's not even just LinkedIn either. I've I've had calls from uh, people who have seen my you know my signature on my email and they'll get my cell phone or on off of the load boards where I've had carriers call me at midnight that I've never even you this was a couple of years ago I had a carrier call me at 1 a.m. in the morning and he looked me up um, based off of my number and my company and he said he called at 1 a.m. I obviously took the call because I'm always available for work, figured it was about a load. And he said that he had seen my picture. And the next time he drove through, he wanted to take me out to dinner. I told him, don't ever talk to me again. And I blacklisted him. It happens all the time. This is horrible. I, I look, especially for married people, like that that can be a very sort of mm -hmm. awkward situation. Someone's <laughs> calling you at one, you know, and then you're oh, like, what is going on here, honey? Like, why is this person calling you? And I well, hope oh, maybe he can step in and intervene. But not everyone has that luxury. Not everyone has rational partners. This can put someone in a bad situation. You, at least you said an important thing, too, that bottling this stuff up, like if, if a woman can't go to anybody about this, like that could cause a lot of d d depression, mental health issues. Um, there's women who have committed suicide over this kind of thing. Yes. Um, I mean, this was, I mean, my, my husband is honestly a wonderful person and he understands, he understands the um, environment and the industry that I work in is pretty much male dominated. And, uh, you know, he has a pretty good understanding, you know, kind of, you know, how this industry is. But um, he was also aware of the situation that um, I was being put in. And he, you know, he was pretty supportive about you know what i was telling him and uh i'm lucky i that's not everybody's situation um and that can be detrimental to somebody's uh relationship which in turn can be detrimental to somebody's relation you know their their mental health and well-being um when you have something not only your finances are in jeopardy but your marriage or your relationship is also in jeopardy now, when these guys contact you on LinkedIn, it's something totally inappropriate. Do you, do you like report it via LinkedIn? Is it so frequent that you just block them and move on with your life? Like you're kind of desensitized to it at this point. What, like, what are you doing? How you, what happens here? Uh, um, I pretty much just block them. Um, unless yeah. the, unless, unless the a message is absolutely ridiculously, uh, forward, um, then yeah, absolutely. I'm going to post it to my page because you deserve to be called out on this. Um, if you are comfortable with, you know, showing your identity, where you work, um, exactly who you are and messaging people like this, uh, you deserve to be called out. Um, if your messages are that inappropriate and especially right off the bat, but mostly um, I just kind of block them or just don't even respond. And I like a lot of people already know about this situation and it's crazy to me that men are still messaging me not like my friends not people that i know yeah but random men that i've been connected with for a while but i've never had a conversation with them but they will still insist on messaging me and it has nothing to do with business it has nothing to do with the events that had taken place, even though I'm pretty sure they're well aware of it. And they're still trying to get in there. This is not, this isn't Tinder. No, it's not. I, I guess, I guess my, like, is there any, is it ever okay to, to, to approach lightly flirting? I mean, cause there's always a line, right? It's, it's a nuanced thing. There's, there's always line across, but I would say in general on LinkedIn, like it's not a dating site. Like, what are you doing? Right. Yeah. Um, I have um, kind of, um, you know, I grew up in a logging town. I grew up around military and then I'm in this industry. And so you like flirting or even, you know, crude jokes, even sexual humor is 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 part of that. And so for me personally, right, it's different for everybody. But for me personally, um, I do have a foul mouth at times. I own that. Yeah. But the difference is, is if somebody tells you to stop and no, or they are not interested, then respect that. Because I know that any of the men that I am friends with or even acquaintances with, if we're making jokes that are inappropriate and I said, hey, I'm uncomfortable with that, they would have respect and go, OK, and they wouldn't do it again. And that's the difference here is it's not that, you know, saying these things necessarily makes you awful or you can't approach me with that type, type of humor or whatever. But if you're in a harassing way and you're saying these things and I'm telling you to stop, then then you've crossed a line. 
but also um, it isn't a dating site. And so there is a level, like if you're saying hi, or you want to, you know, I did have some guy, one guy, he said, hey, I know this is not the most appropriate place. This is not a dating site, but I just wanted to say hello. I really, you know, I've been watching what you post. I'd really like to get to know you. And I said, you know, I'm not available. I'm, you know, I'm not interested, but I'm flattered. Thank you so much. And he has been nothing but business ever since. And so I think, you know, if somebody is just genuinely, it's human nature to want to flirt or to be interested the right in way somebody. To, like, get rejected, back off, preserve relationship, he, and not be like an entire freaking yeah. creep like that. Guys, go out and do, do that. We are yeah. paying way more attention to this. These girls out here, you keep harassing them. I'm going to hear about it. Don't freaking do it. La thank, ladies, thank you so much, not just for doing this for yourselves, but for all the ladies on Logistics who were supporting you on this and wanted to get this message out there that we're paying attention. Thank you so much today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Take care. All right, if you're ready to move more freight, make more money, and manage your freight business with speed and confidence, look to TruckStop for tools that transform the way you move freight. Learn more at truckstop.com. Here's some of my hybrid workers getting to the office. Fucking A. He's gonna stop. Oh, there he is. <laughs> that thing is quick as hell. Must be nice. How? What are you talking about? I'm a hybrid worker. I don't have one of those. It's Will Jenkins. Will Jenkins is here, the man, the myth, the legend, CEO, and founder over at Journey. Will, man, did that last segment blow your mind? Or you work with a lot of ladies. My whole team, I have a team yeah. of five women. And so none of that was a surprise because we've talked about it as a group. And it just fires me up, man. I've, I've had conversations with my team about it. And it is, I don't know, I could tell you stories. It's absolutely Oh, yeah. Them, so. Like Morgan, yeah. for example, super visible, gone viral a few times on LinkedIn. I imagine she gets she's she's ringing bare bells all day long, telling people to get, like guys to met, get off. That is terrible. Crazy. Yeah, it blows my mind. Blows my and amazing to us on LinkedIn. We're like, people can screenshot it. They can send us to leaders. We text this kind of stuff to each other. We, we know you're a creep. Like, dude, you're not getting away with it. <laughs> Correct. Why? Yeah, it's so weird because it's visible. It's very visible. Yeah. So. That. It's not a big industry, not a big business either. And we all know each other and we all talk. So I highly recommend totally. you don't do that stuff. You get called out, you might ruin your entire freaking career. Now, you're not going to ruin your career, though. You actually came up with something really cool. You go, hey, some people, they might say the wrong thing on the phone. They may not know how to do a sales call. They might not know how to role play. They need a little bit of training. She said, everyone's talking about AI. Not enough people are talking about role playing. What if I put them together? What did you do, Will? Yeah, so... I can't take all the credit because I didn't develop the technology, but yeah. developed a partnership with an organization that um, has built an environment that allows sales reps to, a to role play with AI agents that respond like your target market would. So I, I met them early 2024, so it's probably February or March, and just started talking about the use case for transportation and then built some demo bots, um, got the deal going. And so now we have access to be able to allow our clients to set up an environment where they can put their reps through different role plays. So if we wanted to do a cold call, if we wanted to do an intro call, a discovery call, warm call, all these different environments, um, they allow reps to work through those scenarios. And I've been in sales for a long time, but when I first started, you know, you really have to get your shots up. Like you got to go and practice and practice and work through your pitch. And sometimes when you role play with a manager or with a person, um, they're not always as realistic as you would like them to be because the person that you're role playing with knows what you're supposed to say to an extent, or they might not be, you know, as harsh as they need to be, or they might be too easy. So it's been really, really cool to work our, our clients through it and, and kind of see their reps progress. And then with the sales bootcamp that we're doing next month, everyone that attends the bootcamp actually gets access to the role playing tool for a month. So excited to, to get rolling with it. Very, very cool. Were, were we able to figure out a way that you could like perhaps demo it? Are you able to talk about it at all? So we tried it and they were having an issue kind of feeding it into the headphones i believe so yeah we could try it on your laptop potentially but it's supposed to be used on on a headset so it might not pick up the responses might be a little slow but i'm, I'm down to try it real quick oh i mean it might make more sense to to tell people where they could can, can anyone go and like try it right now is that is that possible so I actually, I'll say this, if you send me a, a note on LinkedIn, I can send you a temporary login to check it out and role play. We have a demo environment. And so it's the best way to see how the tool works in a month or so we'll have 
uh, one actually up on our website so people can role play with it. It'll be a uh, time gated. So you'll get like 60 or 90 seconds to do a cold call or warm call to work through it. Um, but if you're interested in trying it out and you want to see what it's like, we've got a handful of different bots in there. One of them uh, is, is set up to be like the director of transportation for Caterpillar. So if you're doing heavy haul, uh, things like that. And then I've got another discovery call that's set up to be the director of transportation of a, a large food and beverage organization. So really, really niche, depending on the types of modes that you all move. But in the background, we're able to kind of augment the inputs so that they respond the way that particular mode or commodity would based on their uh, value drivers. Like, can, can, does, do these bots have different personalities? Like, can I make it be like, oh, yeah. asshole, or can I make it be really short with you? Yes. So when you open up the tool and you begin your role play, it'll say rude, less rude. It'll say that the person is short. Uh, I can see this on our end so that when we create them, we can make them a sliding scale of, of difficulty. And so in our, our test environment, there's a couple of different ones. And then the environment that our clients get when they license it, we have all different types. Some are significantly more challenging. Some are a little bit easier to work through, but that's kind of the nature of sales. Like some of your, your clients are not assholes and some are. <laughs> so it's like uh, a mixed bag. Any parts with the AA where you're like, uh, this needs improvement here? Like, how are they trading this? Are they taking real sales calls and, and real like d traffic managers and stuff and, and using that as data? So uh, a lot of the stuff on the back end is me understanding the industry and then putting in objections or challenges. So, hey, you've got an, a national food manufacturing company. Maybe they have a preference for asset-based providers and they only want to work with large name brand, like top 20 brokerages. So if you're a smaller shop, you really have to sell your differentiators. And why would they give you an opportunity when they've got great relationships with a couple of asset providers and some really, really strong brokerages? So a lot of that information is, is industry specific input. But in terms of training the tool, um, the, the, the company that we partner with has spent hours and hours and hours working through general role plays to be able to get the tool up to the point where it works and it seems rather realistic obviously there's you know sometimes a slight delay in a, in a response or things like that but uh it's it's incredible to be able to get that immediate feedback and then once you're done with your role play you actually get a script so it'll show you a transcript of what the call was how the bot responded how you responded words per minute filler words things like that did you use uh you know permission-based opener things of that nature to give you feedback um, and then if you're on the management side and the rep as well you can download and listen to your call to use it for improvement that, I mean, like that alone is so much more than we currently get when we're sort of training in sales calls. I've done that stuff. I've been on the sales side. And usually what happens is you're in a room, like your company might have like one sales training se seminar like a year and or like and like it might not even happen every year. And then you're all in a room and, you know, the guy's like, let's go do some role play. And then you get to go up there once. Yes. Like, because like 20 other people have to go and you have like, and most people like, especially in the middle, you just kind of start joking and like, you don't learn anything and you don't really get any feedback. No, it's really tough. And I, I have a couple of hills that I am willing to die on, one of which is role playing and practice and sales. I've worked with reps that were not the skilled conversationalist to begin with, but they were willing to do the work over and over and over. And you spend the time with them working through different scenarios, you do your value proposition, you work through an actual cold call, a schedule call, all these things. But if they're willing to invest the time, you got to be willing to give it back to them and help them work to get better and better. And I've seen those reps progress and have a couple top of mind that are really heavy hitters at the brokerages they're at today because they spent the time to get better. But not every environment is set up that allows a rep to be able to practice over and over. They might not have the right sales manager or the right L&D team. And so when I was thinking about what journey could be from a training capacity, Let's level the playing field to give people access to really, really good training, regardless of where you're at. If you're an individual and you want to license our training through the academy or you're a brokerage and you want to license our training and have your own environment, let's give you the tools to equip your reps so that if you don't have a massive L&D team, they still have a place to go practice. It's one of the best ways to increase retention and see people ramp up faster. Yeah, no, it's, it's good. It, look, it, you often feel like, an, especially in outside sales where I was, you often feel like you're out on an island and you're fighting for your life and you're fighting for survival and you barely even feel tethered to your own company. So some training is great. Now, how do people go and find out about this? How do, like you mentioned, you could potentially demo it. How do they go and do that? Where yeah. How do they reach out? Yep. Super easy. So I am really, really active on LinkedIn. So anyone can reach out to me there. Just Will Jenkins. My email is will at journeydelivers.com. 
And then if you're interested um, in the product, you can take a look at it on our website and it's academy.journeydelivers.com. At the top, if you click AI role-playing tool, um, you can fill out a submission and, and I'll reach out to you. But anyone that wants to try it, if you want to take a look at it, um, feel free to shoot me a note via email or on LinkedIn and I can get you a quick temporary access to test the bot and you can get humbled or maybe you crush your call and it goes really well, but they are challenging. They are challenging. Hey, Will, thank you so much. Have an awesome weekend. I hope everyone goes checks out at that tool and uh, fight the good fight and don't be a creep in the DM, guys. You're on watch. Uh, find me on Twitter at Timothy Duner. That's D W O N E R. A to the gift shop. Go to WTTgear.com. Uh, go to WFreightways.com. You can see the whole show notes in here. Go follow all my guests. Go check out Will's demo. Leave the girls alone. Don't scam anybody on Tesla semis. Oh, Troop Monday. Coming up Monday, noon Eastern time. We got Trooper Ben. It's going to be on the show with Zane Holcomb. I reached out to me and said, any magicians in freight? He's going to do magic tricks for us. That'll be fun. I'm traveling. All right, have a good weekend. Take care. Don't be a stranger.